Totally not awkward at all. Nothing. <laughs> He said, oh, yes, I'm Magic Clark. I'm from 2.84 up in Loveland in Miami Project. Yay, let's go. So, it's for LTO. It's going to be a scale model solar system for you new people. This is just going to be a rehash for old friends. But it's a scale model solar system, only for distance because 3D models are hard to do. And so it's going to be like a plaque like this on a post. It's going to have like distance from the sun, how many moons it has, surface gravity, diameter length of day, and then super special fun fact down on the bottom is Pluto. Yeah. And it loves you. So how did you decide whether to? To include Pluto as part of the. <laughs> 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 because Pluto is obviously a planet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> them, them's fighting words. And he twisted our arm. So, uh, long story short, post in the ground with feeling platform uh, on that roadway that you walked up to get here. Like so. Laser tongue. I was too lazy to put in terrestrial plants because why not? And Pluto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and there's Neptune, Saturn, and such. So, uh, yeah, if you didn't spend any money today on chemical services, why well, don't I donate? My project, so I may actually do it. Thanks for your time. Evan uh, does need funds for his project and everything else. Box My box. special gold box. So uh, gold uh, box, uh, black box. We, we will match as the observatory will match any funds at this time. All right. Yeah, that's, that's me. Hey, Jay, would you mind minimizing that and bringing the PowerPoint forward? Oh, and go to, yeah, I'll, I'll get back up there. Thank you. I'm John Ensworth. I sometimes give the main talk, but uh, over the last year or so, I've been giving a little warm up talks. And last time we just had lost Stephen Hawking, hadn't had time to put anything together. I'm doing a little memorial for him here. Uh, all I'm going to do is talk about high level ideas of what he contributed to. And there's one extremely dense slide that I'm going to rattle off all the projects he made some contribution to. Uh, but definitely this field uh, that he worked in, astrophysics and cosmology and quantum gravity, is one that's very much under development. It's not done, and he didn't finish it in his lifetime, and that's what we'll, we'll cover in just for a minute here. There are some rare pictures I found of him. It's a baby picture or a kid, little kid picture, and he's younger. as his pre-wheelchair, obviously. Uh, there he is with his young family. Okay, he's getting hair pulled, I'm not sure. And there he is in the background watching kids run. And a cookout. And a little bit later in life. So if he, he was a lot of biographical and uh, even autobiographical information out there about his life and, and like that. I'm just going to look at the research stuff that he did. He started uh, a graduate student working on Big Bang stuff with uh, Dr. Dennis, is it Schema, I think? I'm not really sure. He went to get a position with Fred Hoyle, a very uh, famous astronomer, and he had all the students that he could work with and didn't accept him. He was sort of, had a reputation for being a goof off, even though he was brilliant. And so Fred, I guess, didn't, didn't go out of the way to get him in there. Now, Fred Hoyle was also anti-Big Bang and coined the term Big Bang to make fun of the concept. So probably it was a good idea in the end 
that Stephen ended up with uh, someone else who gave him some more freedom uh, of direction of study. One of his early uh, things he proved was that mathematically, uh, with a black hole having a singularity at it, it, at its heart, if you run time backwards, then the universe itself goes back to a singularity. So he showed that, that the Big Bang model, starting with the singularity, worked mathematically. Uh, and this began what we now have the need for in physics, and that is a theory for quantum gravity. We'll get right back to that in a minute. Uh, one of the big questions out there about black holes was something dealing with the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, what happens? Um, he pointed out that if matter and energy went down a black hole to vanish permanently, it would break that law because the, over time, entropy increases in the universe, period. It just marches forward. Well, if you could destroy energy and matter, then you'd actually make the entropy of the universe go down, going the opposite direction. Um, Jacob Birkenstein, or Birkenstein came along and showed that the increase in the size of a black hole answered this, that the entropy of the universe increased with that. Uh, Hawking heard that and hated it, which Jacob was right out of grad school and that made him really uncomfortable, but he stuck to his guns. Hawking went home to prove him wrong mathematically and found the reverse, actually found the math that created what now is named Hawking radiation. He showed that the randomness uh, created in the quantum particles at the edge of a black hole uh, was the same as the randomness needed uh, just comes from heat being generated. So uh, we now have the Birkenstein Hawking entropy and this is one of the more significant developments in this whole uh, field, and this is what he asked to be put on his tombstone after he died. So this is a, a little more useful version of it, but this is the one that he asked to be put on his tombstone. And this, this simple equation, you know, it's not as easy to put on a t-shirt as E equals mc squared, but it includes quantum mechanics, the constant, the speed of light with c, which is, has relativity, and the Boltzmann constant, which brings in thermodynamics. So it takes three main pillars of physics and jams them together fantastically. What's the A there? Uh, it's the area, uh, surface area of the black hole in Planck units, I believe. Or, yeah, Planck units divided by four. So, yeah, the f factor four down there. Um, he finally gave in and agreed that, that information is not lost down a black hole either. He had a bet with uh, another physicist going on. But that's created a really, I'm not going to get into this, maybe this will be a future big talk. But the firewall paradox that, <laughs> how simple can I make it? Um, basically, particles fall in the black hole and get away from the black hole, that's what makes a black hole eventually evaporate. That's Hawking radiation. And something spooky happens with these particles that if you don't handle this properly, a particle gets kind of counted twice. And that can't happen. So we have this little firewall paradox to try to solve that. And this is an unsolved area in physics, but he definitely made inroads in helping pave the way for how this would be handled. So he was working for a theory of everything that would put quantum mechanics, which handles the very small, relativity, which handles the very large, together into one nice, uh, simple law that basically covers everything. And Hawking radiation and, and the entropy of a black hole was a good first step. Um, so, again, he did not complete this theory of everything in his lifetime. He just gave us a way forward to do that. Uh, one of the ways that, one of the things we need to solve that, that he worked on was uh, in light. We know that there are quantized particles of light, bits of light we call photons. 
And the whole field that covers that is quantum electrodynamics, incredibly successful uh, branch of, of physics. What we need is a quantum gravity or quantized gravity where we have gravitons. But if you try using the, our current physics to have gravitons bounce off each other, or a graviton bounce off an electron, if that happens, uh, the math goes absolutely crazy, and it basically would predict that all, everything should explode and be destroyed. But we aren't, we're here. So this is the conundrum that physics um, has, but it does mean there are many more paychecks to come for physicists. <laughs> Um, so he believed that string theory was a solution to this, but really couldn't work well in the field because of his disability. Uh, the results of, of the predictions made by string theory can't be tested with present day equipment and Hawking radiation, even though astronomers are very convinced that it exists, can't be observed either. Black holes are all taking in more than they're giving out because the universe is still really hot left over from the Big Bang itself. Um, so he, he didn't get to complete this in his lifetime. But here's, here's the killer slide. There's a quick, I'm going to just read through it fast, all the different areas of physics that he contributed to. So he worked at linking quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole and opened up the field of quantum cosmology. He worked on cosmic inflation, the helium production in anisotropic an Big Bang universes, large N cosmology, the density matrix of the universe, topology and structure of the universe, baby universes, Yang-Mills instantons, and the S matrix, anti de Sitter space, quantum entanglement and entropy, the nature of space, time, and the arrow of time involving the thermodynamics. Space-time, foam, string theory, supergravity, Euclidean, quantum gravity, the gravitational Hamiltonian, the brands Dickey and Hoyle, Narlicker theories of gravitation, gravitational radiation, holography, time symmetry, and wormholes. That's just a little bit of stuff. Um, he also really was a modern icon of physics and astronomy, and he left behind some of the most famous books that's popularized these topics with the brief history in time, universe in a nutshell, a briefer history of time, grand design. He also has um, uh, autobiography, autobiography and some other books. So Stephen Hawking, you'll be missed. We got a lot of stuff you've left us to finish. That's all I have. Thank you. Here's a super laser. Is it up now? Yep, there we go. Computers are here to make our lives easier. Okay, I think I'm, I think I'm all settled here. Oh, that's not going to stay. I'll just hold it. All right. Thank you guys all for coming. Good evening. Uh, I'm Allison Bartow, as we mentioned earlier. I'm the program manager for the James Webb Space Telescope at Ball Aerospace. Um, so we'll get into it here with all my accoutrements. Um, for those of you that tweet and Facebook and all that kind of thing, you can follow us and the telescope, these places. All right, so who am I? Uh, I've worked at Ball for about the last 20 years. I grew up in Seattle, Washington. And I first got bit by the astronomy bug when I was about 10 years old on a camping trip at Mount Rainier. It was one of the few cloudless nights. Uh, we don't have a lot of them in Seattle. For those of you amateur astronomy, astronomers in the room, I do recall one summer where we had a total of four cloudless nights the entire summer. 
so it was a little hard location, but it was a, a surprisingly clear night and the ranger um, brought us up the side of the mountain and told us some fantastic stories pointing out both the constellations, the Greek myths behind them, which when you're 10 are super exciting. They're super exciting now too, but they were even better then. Um, and also talked about the science of what we were looking at. And that's really when I decided, you know what, this is what I want to do with my life. So throughout high school, I was part of an amateur astronomy um, society, much like some of you guys here. There's bad quality picture of a picture. Um, our big star party that we would have every summer, that's a very, very small piece of it. Um, and, and so I grew up doing, doing this uh, through high school, and then I went to college at Harvey Mudd College in Southern California for physics. And I had been planning to go on and study relativity, so if any class in school had anything to do with the real world, I didn't take it. Um, and, and then I decided I really wanted to be part of the real world, so that was kind of an about face. Um, I came to Ball, I learned how to be an engineer on the job. Um, I've been working on the James Webb Space Telescope for the last 16 years. I was a systems engineer on the program for the first decade, figuring out what we wanted to build, how we could make sure it met the science requirements, how to actually build it, and then how to test it. And for the last six years or so, I've been managing the program with all of our deliveries, and we'll get into what that is a little bit. Um, so, star party, and then there's the telescope I work on today with its sides folded up a little bit. So I upgraded a little bit in size of telescope. <laughs> all right, uh, so you guys all get this. From the beginning of time, you know, people have looked up in the sky with awe and wonder. And I think one of the amazing things about astronomy, the reason it connects it to us all, is it really gives you both this sense of being part of something and the sense of being very small at the same time. And, and that creates all sorts of interesting thoughts in our heads and trying to understand what does this mean and where do we come from and what's going on out there. And so this is really the first science, right? We've always looked up at the sky and tried to understand what it meant and what it meant about our place. And so we started with you know, early astronomers who were able to recognize that, gosh, not all the things up there are moving the same way. Some of them are moving the way they're supposed to. And, and that seemed mysterious, so we called them gods, and we have the planets named after, you know, the Greek gods that were the objects in the sky that weren't moving correctly. And, and so we slowly, we observed them with more and more detail, started to learn, you know, when do we want to plant our crops based on what we're seeing. Um, and then, and then, a little over 400 years ago, this man, kids in the room, anyone know who this is? Adults? Galileo? There we go. A little over 400 years, Galileo created the first telescope. And he looked up at the sky and again found something that wasn't moving, the way, wasn't the way it was supposed to be. He looked at the moon, which was supposed to be a perfect sphere because we knew that everything in the heavens was perfect. So we look in the sky, to let's find this perfect sphere, and instead the moon is full of mountains and valleys. He looked at Venus and saw that it had phases, it didn't just shine clearly. He looked at Jupiter and saw, lo and behold, there were items orbiting Jupiter. Now we knew that everything in the universe revolved around us, so this was clearly disturbing. Uh, but like all people and like all of humankind, this always just brings more questions, right? This curiosity that it brings out, gosh, we thought we understood and we don't. I want to learn more. And so this began the large race to build larger and larger telescopes. Newton developed the reflecting telescope where we used mirrors, curved mirrors to reflect the light rather than lenses. And the race was on. We built larger and larger telescopes over the years. Here's a few here. The Yerke 40-inch um, 40, 40 refractor, one of the largest refractors. 
ever. Now the problem with building larger and larger refractors is that the weight of that lens in the front, um, so it's a convex convex lens, it gets really heavy and it gets so heavy that it, you can't make it anymore and it will um, not hold up. So we needed to build refl reflectors. Mount Wilson, we have a good history to Mount Wilson here um, at Little Thompson with, some, with the telescopes that you guys have. There's the 100 inch reflector um, and then the 200 inch reflector at Mount Palabar. And for those of you in the audience who are younger and only know cameras as being on your phones, um, it's interesting to notice this right here, that's a man sitting out here on the telescope and he had to ride around all night with the telescope because in order to take a picture, and here, look, she did this too. So this is, that's- one of the last people to use up the photographic plate stock. Right. So he had to actually replace the glass plates to take the photographs. Um, good on you. <laughs> it was really fun. And the telescope is really big. <laughs> And so we build bigger and bigger telescopes. Um, the challenge though is even though today we build even larger telescopes on the ground, we have many telescopes that are 10 meters, we're building 30 meter telescopes, Europe is building even larger telescopes, there's still a fundamental limit to the performance of telescopes on the ground. And that is that we have to look through the atmosphere. And the atmosphere causes problems in a couple ways. The first is that we're looking through stuff, so the light is bouncing off of that. So images will always be a little bit blurry. We have ways to try to deal with that by deforming our mirrors really fast, but that's hard. And there's a limit to how well we can do it. Um, the other problem is even if we could completely stabilize that and, um, and get nice, clear images, the light, not all light, gets down to the ground. So at the top here, you can see this rainbow area. We'll use this one. This is the visible light. This is light that we see. But there is a lot more to the electromagnetic spectrum than just the light we can see. There are x-rays and ultraviolet. There is infrared. Um, and anywhere where you see this, this color here up high, that means the atmosphere is absorbing that wavelength of light. So the light we see can get all the way down. We get a little bit of infrared light can make it down. And radio, this is why radio works for us, those waves make it down. Um, but the long, mid and long infrared, uh, the very long radio waves, and anything shorter than visible is absorbed by our atmosphere. If we have a telescope on the ground, we will fundamentally always have this problem. Now this problem is important for some science that we're going to talk about with Webb later on, so remember this. All right, so what NASA decided to do was to put telescopes in space so we could get away from these problems. If we're outside of the atmosphere, we both don't have to worry about the effects of light coming through the atmosphere and what that does to the seeing and we are able to observe the entire infrared, um, or sorry, the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So they devised a plan to create four great observatories. There was the Compton, um, Compton, the Sh Compton Gamma Ray, Chandra X-ray, Spitzer in the infrared, um, and then the one that we all know best, Hubble, which is primarily a visible telescope, um, but it also has some UV capabilities and some shortwave infrared capabilities. Um, all four of these telescopes have um, instrumentation or parts on them that were built here in Colorado at Ball Aerospace. We were involved in all of the great observatories. An interesting story, we were talking a little bit about um, having to ride around with the telescope to change the glass plates. So our original plan, the original idea of putting a telescope in space was actually drafted by Lyman and Spitzer in 1946, early days of rocketry. Already we knew that if we could put a telescope up there, we could see so much more. But one of the problems they have is that 
we had to change those glass plates. So an astronaut was gonna have to live up with the telescope, and you can see some early sketches where, where this is envisioned. The problem, though, is this astronaut whose whole job was gonna be to live in this telescope in space and change the glass plates in and out so we could take these pictures. But the problem is every time he did that, he would end up moving the telescope, and so pointing was gonna be really hard. So it wasn't until we developed good CCD technology for the spy satellite, spy plane programs in the late 60s that finally we really had the technology that we needed to be able to put a telescope in space. And so in the 70s, we started the Hubble Space Telescope program. Um, it was initially going to launch in the late 80s. It got delayed by the Challenger explosion and finally launched in 1990. And actually just yesterday was its 28th anniversary. Uh, so if you haven't gone online and seen the new anniversary picture that they sent out, um, you know, that they put out, look at it because it's beautiful. Um, and make sure you look at it both in UV, or sorry, both in the visible and in their infrared version. Actually, I guess I think I, think I updated my charts. You're going to see it here. Take that back. We're about to see it. All right. So like any telescopes, just like Galileo's, we put these four great observatories up and we've been studying the sky, and it has revolutionized our understanding of what's up there, right? When we launched Hubble, we did not know that there's a black hole at the center of every galaxy. Um, extrasolar planets had not been detected. So astronomy has, and our understanding of the universe has really advanced over the last quarter, cent over quarter century that these have been up there, and they've caused more questions. Right? Every question we answer leads to at least 10 more questions that we have that we now need to answer. So to solve this, answer these next questions, NASA devised um, to build the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope has at its core a mission to understand origins. The four main science themes are to be able to observe the very first generation of luminous objects after the Big Bang. So we're gonna look back well over 13 billion years to see that first generation of stars. We wanna understand how galaxies evolve. If you think of a galaxy today, you think of a beautiful spiral galaxy, but they didn't always look like that. Galaxies far back at the beginning of the universe just looked like blobs. And so we want to understand how did they develop from these early kind of amorphous looking structures to what we see today. Um, and then we also want to understand the origins of stars. How do stars form? How do planets form? What do the protoplanetary disks look like? And, and then more fundamental origins of life. Is there other life out there? And how can we try to find planets that show signs of having the, the um, makeup that they need to support life? This is what the James Webb Space Telescope looks like, the telescope we've devised to answer these questions. Now, if you look at it, this does not look a lot like the telescopes you have up in the domes here. It probably doesn't look a lot like what you think of when you think of a telescope. Um, what we're gonna talk about tonight is why does it look this way? And how do scientists and engineers go from the question they have, the scientific questions they wanna answer, to figuring out what it is they should build? Um, the James Webb Space Telescope, as I said, it's a NASA project. It's an international collaboration. There are inputs from uh, European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, the telescope and observatory itself is built here in the United States with a team from across the country. The primary um, contractor is Northrop Grumman, located in Los Angeles. Here in Colorado at Ball Aerospace, we built all of the mirrors for the telescope, everything that allows us to move the mirrors around, um, as well as the software that we use to figure out how to align the telescope in flight and a bunch of other little things. Um, ATK in Utah built the structure that holds all those mirrors in place, and then it was integrated um, with support from Harris out at NASA Goddard Space Center. So it's a big program. Just creating these mirrors 
was really involved the entire country. The path you're seeing here is the path that these mirrors took back and forth across the country as we went from initial hardware um, material production to final mirrors. So we're going to talk a little bit about why was this the process and, and what goes into building something of this scale. OK, so we're going to start by thinking about our science goals. All right, the first science goal is to see very faint objects, right? those first luminous objects after the Big Bang. These, this light has been traveling to us across the universe for over 13 billion years. We are lucky to capture a few of those photons. So what do we need to do if we want to see very faint objects? We have an engineering solution. We want to build a very large mirror. Here you see a picture of the Hubble primary mirror. Um, so you can see people in there for scale. Here are two of the 18 segments and the same scale that make up the James Webb Space Telescope's primary mirror. Here is the completed telescope and there's a person for scale. So we have a six and a half meter diameter mirror. And the reason we want a larger mirror is because the bigger the mirror, the more light you can collect. So just like you could put a cup out in your yard and you could put a swimming pool out in your yard, both empty, and it could rain an inch, they'll both have an inch of rain in them after, after the rainstorm. But the volume of water that's in the pool will be much larger than the volume of water in the cup because the area of the pool is larger. Primary wears on a telescope work the same way. So that's why we like really big telescopes. OK, so the challenge we have here is that every solution creates another challenge, right? So just like every question creates another more questions, Every solution creates more challenges. So we had a goal to see faint objects, have an easy solution, build a really big mirror. Uh, however, that mirror is way too big to fit in a rocket. All right, so, but no fear, we have more solutions. We designed what we call the origami telescope. <laughs> we actually fold our telescope up to fit into a rocket fairing, and then while we are on our way out to our orbit, we deploy. So this video, oops, Let's see, it should just start. Can someone back there see if you can figure out how to hit play on that? It normally just starts. All right, there we go. Thank you. Um, so while we are on our way to our final orbit, which takes about a month, we go through all these deployments. First, we need to deploy this large, well, the first thing that happened is we deployed our uh, solar panel so we can get power. Then we deploy our large sun shield. We're gonna talk a little bit about why we have this sun shield. Um, so this involves so a couple hundred individual mechanisms that help tension this five layer sun shield. So you'll see the five layers separating right here. to their final configuration. And then this, this process takes maybe about 15 days, everything you've seen so far. And then we are ready to deploy our secondary mirror, the two sides of the primary mirror. Um, that happens up through about day 20. And then at that point, we're ready to start actually aligning all of those mirrors. Okay, so good. We needed to see faint objects. We built a big mirror. It's too big to fit for a rocket, so we folded it up. We've got, we've got it so far. Um, so we had this solution. This is good, but we still have more problems because launch is really, really violent. We make big segmented telescopes on the ground, but none of them have to launch. So this is a video of a vibration test of one of our mirror segments showing the kinds of loads that it's going to see when it launches. So this is just in one direction. 
and, and I'm guessing none of you want to do that to your telescopes. <laughs> <laughs> So we need to make sure that after we do all this, first of all, after we do all this, we need to make sure that the shape of the mirror is preserved. Um, and then the other thing, the other problem we have, all right, enough of that, um, is that when we get in up, we're going to look at a star. And this is what our first image of that star is going to look like. Remember how I said that star? This is not a picture of several galaxies, few out of focus stars, something like that. This is a picture of a single point source viewed through 18 individual misaligned mirrors. Right? So remember how in order to be able to get this big mirror into space, we had to break it up into pieces. So when we get up there, they're each going to be pointed a little different because they just went through that crazy vibration. And what we want is to align all of these mirrors together so they act as if they are one monolithic large mirror. So we've got to figure out how to turn that into something scientifically useful because that is not. Um, so we have a process called wavefront sensing and control. And this is how we look at the images from the science cameras and use them to figure out how to move the objects. So first of all, we see these 18 spots. And we know they correspond to our mirrors, but we don't know what's what. So what's the first thing you would do if you were trying to solve this? Ideas? Yeah, absolutely. We do just what you would think. We take one mirror, and we tilt it, and we figure out which spot moved, and we know which one that is. And we do that process 18 times until we've been able to figure out which mirror is each one of those 18. Um, then we take those and um, for convenience we put them into an array that corresponds to where they are on the physical mirror. Uh, they don't need to be in that shape, it's just easy for us to keep track of them that way. Um, and then we end up with spots like this and we go through this iterative, iterative process where we take images in and out of focus and figure out how we would want to move each mirror to focus each of those spots. And then once we do that, once they're pretty good, then we start tilting them all in because we want them all to be acting as one telescope, which means the light from all of these needs to go to the same spot. Um, so we slowly bring them in um, and eventually they all end up together and we have a beautiful um, point source. Now, how do we do this? We have uh, what we call an active telescope. Some of you may have heard of adaptive optics. We use that on the ground to be constantly adjusting the shape of a mirror to be able to compensate for things like atmospheric effects. Um, we are not adaptive. We don't move in real time. We're active in that we can move, but we don't do it too often. Um, so we have created um, actuators on the backs of each of our mirrors so that we can move them around. So each of those primary mirror segments can move in six degrees of rigid body motion, so we can move them anywhere we want, and then we also can change the curvature. Um, and then the secondary mirror has, again, that rigid body motion, so we can position it where we want, um, but no curvature, curvature adjustment. And just to give some feel for what we need to do here, these um, actuators, we need to be able to cover a large range. Large for us is 25 millimeters. So each one has a, th a total distance it can move of around 25 millimeters, which lets us deploy all the mirrors because when we went through that violent launch, that mirror was actually snubbed up and, and locked in place so that it didn't rattle around too much. You know, it looked like it was rattling a lot. That was not too much. Um, because we don't want it to run into the mirror next to it. We only have six millimeters between these mirrors when we launch. Um, so we need to be able to move out and then um, have enough range to align it where we want. But we have to be able to control it so well so that they work together. The step size on our actuators is about seven nanometers. Now, a nanometer, what is that? It's a really small number. It kind of feels imaginary. Um, borrow your piece of paper. All right, so most of you have a piece of paper in your hand. Take your piece of paper, look at it edge on. That is somewhere in the 100 to 200,000 nanometer thick range, that piece of paper. We move seven nanometers at a time. 
So. Now, how do you do that? Because you can't just have little gears that small. Right. We have a um, a flexured system. So when we when we move our motor, it pushes on a little bit of metal that causes a whole bunch of other pieces of metal to slowly move a little bit, and that will just ever so slightly change the length of the actuator. Okay, so, so this is good though, right? We've figured out how to get this really big mirror into space and make it work like a really big mirror. Everything's pointed together. Um, okay, so this, this is the newly released image. Um, so it's pretty beautiful, isn't it? Um, okay, so our next science goal is to observe star birth and understand how plan protoplanetary systems form, how these disks end up coalescing into planets. Um, now, how do we do that? This is a picture in the visible. So if we look up in the sky and you have a nice powerful telescope like Hubble above the atmosphere, you can take a photograph that looks like this. However, you can't really see what's going on. If we look in the infrared, it looks like that. So what we're doing here is we are looking through the cold dust to see the stars that are being formed inside. Just like infrared goggles, night vision goggles that you hear about, um, you know, infrared sees heat signatures. And so we can look in the infrared and see these hot stars being formed within the cold dust of space. Um, our other goal is to look for signatures of life in the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. Now, again, for this, remember how I said early on, remember, the, remember that plot that showed what wavelengths of life didn't make it to the Earth? They didn't make it to the Earth because our atmosphere was absorbing that light. Our atmosphere absorbs light based on the constituents in our atmosphere. So for example, our atmosphere has water in it. And these little peaks you see is the absorption that you get when, there's, when you're going through, looking through water, and this is all in the infrared. And if you remember, when we looked at that, that graph that showed what light made it down, after the rainbow of the visible, there were all these kind of peaks in the infrared. That's because we have water in our atmosphere. Um, so oxygen here, here's the UV, um, has this peak out here in the infrared that's good to find. But also notice that we have oxygen in our atmosphere. That's why we don't see it here. But that's why we need to look in these wavelengths here to see um, you know, to see water, to see carbon dioxide, to try to look for oxygen, look for methane, either building blocks of life or byproducts of life. And so for the same reasons we can't see that light on the ground because our atmosphere absorbs it, that's why we want to look at other planets and their atmospheres in those wavelengths because we want to see if they're absorbing that, right? Because if they show this these same signatures, then we know their atmospheres have the same constituents that ours does. And by understanding the ratios of these different constituents, we can infer if there's a high probability that there's life on that planet. All right, so observing the infrared again. And then finally, we want to observe that very first generation of stars after the Big Bang. And again, for this, we need to look in the infrared because light that's coming from the early universe has been redshifted. And what does redshifted mean? Imagine a water wave, right? It looks like this. Imagine that you then took and stretched that wave out. The distance between all those peaks would get farther apart. Well, that's what happens to light waves traveling through the universe as the universe expands. The everything, the universe is everything, right? So as the universe expands, it literally stretches those waves, wavelengths of light, those waves of light with it. The distance between their peaks gets wider 
red light has a longer wavelength, a longer distance between those peaks than blue light. So this is what red shifting is. The light left the star in the visible, and now it's been stretched out, and so it's that same light that used to be visible is now infrared light. So in order to observe the early universe, we need to look in the infrared. So this is good that all our science themes require the same thing. Um, our solution to look in the infrared. So this is simple, we just make an infrared detector, right? There's always a problem. Remember we were talking about night vision goggles, right? Warm objects emit in the infrared. You and I are emitting infrared. If our telescope is warm, it is also emitting infrared. So if our telescope is warm, then all we're gonna see is the glow of our telescope. And we're not going to see these faint signals that we're looking for from the early universe. All right, so that's right, an example like we saw before of visible versus infrared in the sky, visible and infrared with a person. Um, so what do we do? Anybody? Cold. Make it cold, exactly. Straightforward, right? So we need to stay really, really, really cold though, not just kind of cold. Um, what we need to do is we need to cool our whole telescope down to about minus 30, or sorry, to about 30 Kelvin. Now what is 30 Kelvin? Um, so in Fahrenheit, that would be around negative 405 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and for those of you that remember your high school or college um, chemistry and physics, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. Nothing can be colder than that. Matter stops, electrons aren't moving. Impossible to be colder than zero Kelvin. We, um, room temperature is around 293 Kelvin. We need to be 30. Uh, so we do this in a couple ways. The way we cool a lot of infrared instruments down that we use in astronomy regularly, whether it's on the ground for those little bits of infrared we can see or in space, is we actively cool the instrument. Like, you know, put it in our refrigerator, essentially. But our telescope is really, really big. We cannot send a refrigerator that large up to space. So we do it passively in two ways. The first is our orbit. We go to an orbit location called L2, the second Lagrange point. This point is four times further away than the moon. So the moon is about 200,000 miles from Earth. We orbit one million miles from Earth. And we orbit the sun just like the Earth does. And as we orbit around the, sun, around the sun, we have the same orbital period as the Earth. It takes us the same amount of time to get around the sun as it takes the Earth to get around the sun, which means that the sun and the Earth are always in a straight line on one side of our telescope. And we're able to take advantage of that because the sun and the Earth and the moon are really hot objects in the sky. And if we looked at them, we could not get as cold as we need to. So we keep them on one side of us and we built this large sun shield. This is what we saw deploying in that video before. It's about the size of a tennis court. And we keep the spacecraft that needs to stay warm. It needs to see the sun to get power in its solar panels. And it's what needs to communicate with the ground. We keep that on one side of this big sunshade. And we keep our telescope up here on the other side. So the sun and the earth are always this way, and we're looking at deep space. Um, so what's the temperature of deep space? Anybody? 2.7. What was that? 2.7. Excellent, 2.7. Um, why is it not zero? We were just learning about um, the Big Bang with Stephen Hawking earlier. That's right, the microwave background. So that leftover heat from the Big Bang makes deep space about 2.7 Kelvin. Now, where we are here looking at deep space, it's really more like 7 Kelvin because we're close to a star and we've got all these other planets around us and that kind of stuff going on. So it's about 7 Kelvin. Um, but that's cold enough that we're able to passively, by looking out at the cold deep space, we're able to passively cool our telescope down to about 7 Kelvin. Now what's interesting is, just like I said, it's not 2.7, which is what we would expect, it's 7 because we've got our galaxy around us. 
when we look at um, when we look into the galactic plane where we're going to see those big beautiful nebula and those star forming regions um, we are about about one and a half tenths of a degree warmer than when we look out of the galactic plane where there isn't a bunch of stars and hot stuff that's where we do our really deep observing of other galaxies so there's a the whole telescope will change its temperature by about one and a half tenths of a degree and that is enough that if we were to sit and look at one location and get our telescope all lined up perfectly and then go to that coldest pointing and wait there till the telescope changes temperature our optics would not be in alignment we would not meet the requirements that we have for how precisely we can image. And so because of that, we regularly have to go up and adjust the alignment of all of the mirrors so that they stay within the performance that we want. Okay, so this seems pretty simple, right? We, well, no, but really, right? We needed to be cold, so we shield all the hot stuff and we look at something cold. That makes sense, not too bad. Um, however, there's always the however, right? Most standard materials change shape very rapidly um, at cold temperatures. So most materials you're used to using day to day, if it's 70 degrees out or if it's 75 or if it's 50, table is still pretty much the same height, right? It doesn't matter too much. Um, most, most materials we're used to working with don't change shape rapidly over temperature, but you might you know, notice doors not fitting and jams in the winter or things like that, or you get heaving and you know, cracks develop in your sidewalk and that sort of thing, because things change temperature, you know, things change shape with temperature. Um, ice expands, that's your cracks, right? Um, so what we need to worry about though is a lot of those materials that don't change too much for you to notice at room temperature. If you got them really, really cold, they'd start changing shape really fast. So the amount of, cha of shape change they'd have over one degree would become bigger and bigger. Uh, so we needed to find a material to use to make these mirrors that would be very stable at these super cold temperatures we have. Because if I'm looking at a hot part or a cold part of the sky, I can't have my whole shape of each individual mirror warp. I can't correct that. I can move my mirrors, but I can't warp them like that. Um, and furthermore, because you know, when we looked at, let's see if I can go back here. When we look at this telescope, right, here's the big sunshade, and, and this, I mean, this is a 600 degree temperature drop between the warm side and the cold side. So it's keeping me pretty cold, but even so, it's warmer right here than it is right here. So there's about a 25 Kelvin temperature difference across that mirror. The bottom part is much warmer than the top part. And I don't want to have to make sure that I can model exactly what the temperature is going to be so well that I can polish my mirror to be right at exactly the right temperature. So what we did is we picked a material that works well for this kind of condition. Beryllium um, is a metal, number three on the periodic table. Um, it is four on the periodic table. Um, sorry about that, forgot about lithium. Um, so it's great because it is very stable at these cold temperatures. However, at room temperature, it changes shape really fast. So trying to measure these mirrors at room temperature is really hard because if we let the temperature vary at all between the top and the bottom of the mirror, between the instrument that's looking at the mirror and the mirror, it, it will be moving around and we won't be able to tell what the performance is. It's kind of hard to deal with at room temperature, but when it's cold, it is rock solid. The shape of these mirrors does not change over probably a 50 Kelvin range. Um, so how do we use, how do we get beryllium? Beryllium is mined in Utah, mostly in Utah. Our beryllium is all from Utah. So there's the mine. Um, we mine the beryllium and then the challenge is for us is, you know, a metal is going to be very predictable in how it performs. Um, 
it's going to always change shape the same way, as long as it's only that metal. But if there's any impurities in it, then they will cause it to change shape differently. And we can't handle that. So we need super pure beryllium. So what they do is they mine this beryllium and then they basically create this beryllium powder. So they're able to make sure it's really, really pure. And we take this powder and we put it into a big, uh, a big box. Essentially our box looks like a hex because that's the shape we want at the end. And we heat it up and we press on it. And it comes out as a solid piece of beryllium. So now we have a solid piece of metal. Now the challenge with this process is that beryllium is highly toxic um, in its powdered form. So once it's a solid mirror, we're good, but um, getting it to a solid, a little dangerous. Machining it, which we're about to talk about, also a little dangerous. Um, so we may create a solid piece of beryllium. We made them a little thick so we could get two blanks out of each one. There you see it cut in half. Um, and then we sent it to Axis Machining um, in California to lightweight it. So you see here's solid, here it's not solid. Um, the other challenge with launching something this big into space is that it's hard to launch heavy things into space, right? It needs more and more fuel. So we had to keep this telescope very light. One of these blanks when it's solid, weighs around 500 pounds. Um, after we finished machining it, it weighs a little under 50 pounds. We take 92% of the material away. So there's where we get to the other advantage of beryllium, which is that it is um, very strong and stiff. And so it's able to perform really well, even when we take all of this material out. Now, getting absolutely every last bit of weight out of this telescope that we could was really important because I mean, this is a big thing to try to launch. And so we actually had to tune how we took the material out. And if you look at it up close, each of those ribs is a different width based on where it is on the mirror and the loads that the mirror is going to see in that location when it launches so that we could get the most material off of that mirror possible. Uh, so here you can kind of see it. Um, let's see, this guy right here is a little thicker than that guy right there. Um, so it just depends on how we're holding, the, where we're holding the mirror. We need to stiffen up around those areas, that sort of thing. Uh, took a little bit of time. All right, so now we've taken all the material out of the backside. We've got a face sheet that's a few millimeters thick, um, and now we need to polish it so that it's the shape that we need. So Tinsley out in California, who did one of your mirrors here, over there? The 18-inch. The 18-inch is from Tinsley. They did all of our beryllium polishing. Um, so they start polishing it, and we get it so that the mirror looks pretty good. However, we need to make sure our mirrors look good at 30 Kelvin. And remember how I said material changes shape. So it actually you know, looks pretty good at room temperature, but then we need to test it cold and see what happens. So here you see a person helping to guide in this test stand with six of the 18 mirrors uh, into this large thermal vacuum chamber, um, the XRCF chamber at Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Um, so we go in there and we test the mirrors and we watch how they change shape as they get cold. So this here is an interferogram. We take an interferometer and we look at the surface of the mirror and it lets you see the high points and the low points. Um, so as you can see here, oh, there's some high points here and there's some low points there. And this is, again, this is how the mirror changed shape when it went from room temperature to a cold temperature. Now, if you imagine going to a, um, like a carnival and they have those funny mirrors, right? And you look at yourself in the mirrors like this and you look all distorted and weird. If our mirror looks like this, that's what our pictures are going to look like. And so we're gonna think we're making some amazing scientific discoveries that are really <laughs> just because our mirror is warping everything. So we don't want that. Uh, we want the mirror to be nice and flat. 
We want it to look like that. So how do we get from this image to that image? Well, what we do when we watch how it goes cold, let's imagine, if you will, that it, it started out like this, nice and flat, and then as it went cold, uh, well, we'll go this way. As it went cold, this happened. It bumped up. Now I have this bump. I don't want that. I go warm again, it's flat. So what I do is I polish the inverse in. I make a little valley in my mirror right in that spot. Now the next time it goes cold, that little valley still wants to bump up. That's what the mirror wants to do right there, but it bumps up to flat. So my mirrors do not look good at room temperature, but they look great at 30 Kelvin, which is what matters. Uh, to give a sense of scale, if one of these mirrors was the size of the United States, we couldn't have any hill or valley larger than about three inches. That is how smooth we need them to be. All right, after we do that, we polish them so they look great at the cryogenic temperatures at which we're operating. Then we coat them all in gold because gold is highly reflective in the infrared. And then we test them again, six mirror test. Um, and then at that point, we're ready to integrate them. So here are some photos where we integrated all of these individual segments onto the back plane. They have covers on them here to protect against them getting too dirty and we end up with a beautiful, um, completely assembled mirror. So this is how we've taken those fundamental science requirements and figured out what is it that, you know, that we need to look like. Now most telescopes you're used to looking at have large tubes on them. Uh, the purpose of the tube is to block stray light. We are controlling our stray light primarily by keeping the big bright things on the other side of that sun shield so we don't need a big tube to do the same thing. Um, we have a few extra paths we want to block so we put a little, there's like a little, we call it a frill around the outside of the primary mirror, just a, a little, I don't know, outline. Um, but that's about it. That's all we need to do. We, have, we, we make sure that we only let light in right where the science cameras need it, but we don't need the big tube. Um, all right, so what have we done now that we have a big assembled telescope? So remember that video we watched earlier where we saw how that one meter shook? And, and I told you that we, kinda, we snubbed them back and we locked them in place for launch so that they wouldn't bump into each other. We, of course, need to prove that. Um, here you see a giant shaker table. And this is the entire telescope, there's a person. This is the entire telescope in, folded up in its launch configuration. Um, and it's being lowered onto that shaker table, so we shook the whole thing. You both shake it, and you also subject it to acoustic loading, the sounds of a rocket. Um, so we did that, and then after that, we needed to test it optically to make sure it worked. How do you test a mirror this big? Uh, you put it in a really big vacuum chamber. This chamber, um, you see two people right here, um, is our second largest thermal vacuum um, chamber in the United States. The largest one is in Plumbrook, Ohio. This is at Johnson Space Center. Um, and this door, fun facts, this door is 40 feet in diameter. It's the largest single hinge door in the world. Um, and, and this was originally used for testing in the Apollo era. We took out all these lights inside and we put in a big helium shroud so that we could take this entire chamber down to 30 Kelvin. So we take all the air out to be like space and then we take the temperature all the way down to our operating temperatures. Um, so here you see a series of images where we roll our telescope into the chamber. Um, yes, that's about one foot of clearance. Ends up in the chamber like this. You guys remember the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie? Remember the Wonka vision where they send the, the, the um, chocolate bar? I always think, I always think these guys kind of look like they're on the Wonka vision. <laughs> um, so we put the telescope in here, we take the people out, we close the door, we pump it down. We did this testing last summer. Uh, it took an entire month to cool the telescope down to 30 Kelvin. Um, and then we did about a month of actual optical and thermal testing to make sure it performed the way we expected. Um, in the middle of that was Hurricane Harvey, right after we reached 
cryostable. Uh, Hurricane Harvey came. We tested through Hurricane Harvey because hurricanes don't happen inside vacuum chambers. Uh, it was a little, we had people that had to sleep there. It was a little hard getting people back and forth. Um, uh, however, we kept going. We persevered and then another month to warm up. At this point, the telescope is in California. Uh, where it will be integrated to the spacecraft. It will go through all that shaking again to make sure that with the spacecraft and the big sun shield, it's still working. And then we will load it onto a barge and we will ship it from California through the Panama Canal over to French Guiana, where we launch on an Ariane 5 rocket. Um, once we launch, it takes about a month to get a million miles away to that L2 point while we well, we're on our way there. We do all those deployments we watched. I said they took about 20 days. By the time we get out to L2, we're all deployed. And then we start actually going through that process to align all of the mirrors. Um, and so we're really excited. As I mentioned, I've been working on this program for six, over 16 years. Um, making just one of these mirrors took five years from the process of beryllium powder to a finished mirror. Um, and so this has been, you know, thousands of people across the country, across the world, uh, even here in Colorado, we've had well over a thousand people at Ball have touched this program in one way or another. And really looking forward to how we are going to not just do the science that we're expecting to, but how we're going to rewrite the astronomy books and answer questions we don't even know to ask today. So thank you. And, and since I believe it's probably still cloudy out, true? Yeah. Last check. <laughs> check again. Still cloudy. We have time for questions. <laughs> yes. When do you launch? Uh, we launch in <laughs> mid 2020. Yeah. Where will the control center be for this telescope? Yeah, this telescope, cloudy. cloudy. Yeah, I'm supposed to say sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so this is going to be controlled at the Space Telescope Science Institute, um, which is located at John Hopkins in Baltimore, and that's the same organization that controls Hubble. Yeah? How big is it going to be? So how big is this telescope? I, I didn't give you my good regular conversions to English units, so the mirror itself is six and a half meters, so that's about 22 feet wide for just the mirror. And then that big sun shield is the size of a tennis court, so it's about 80 feet wide. So it is big. <laughs> Couple stories tall, a few stories tall. Yeah? Spare parts. <laughs> Spare parts. Statement. We have a few. <laughs> but they're not going to L2. Um, so, right, good question. Hubble, we know we had some issues with that when we first launched, um, and we were able to send astronauts up there and fix it. We cannot go fix this. We have never sent people that far away. People have only made it just past the 200,000 miles of the moon on the Apollo 13 um, little extra route they got to do when they swung around the moon due to those issues. Um, so we can't fix it when we're up there. When we're building it, we do have some spares. We have one, so the mirror, the 18 segments, they are three different prescriptions because our mirror is an A-sphere. It's not spherical. And so the so that means that as you go out in diameter, the curvature changes a little bit. So based on how far the mirror is from the center, its curvature is going to need to be slightly different. So there's three different prescriptions of mirrors. There's the mirrors around the center all look the same, and then the next ones, and then the ones out on the points. Um, so we had one spare for each of those prescriptions, but only one of them was taken all the way through final um, polishing and coating. The other two are in different states. Um, you have more spares of things like motors and little things like that. Um, and so there's a few spare things still sitting out there. At this point, we've been through most of our testing, so hopefully we don't need to press any of those into action because once you get a fully integrated telescope, it's really hard to replace things. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Is there a concern of things like micrometeoroids and other things colliding into it? Awesome question. Micrometeoroids. So those are 
like super energetic dust particles that are so energetic they will poke holes through things. So when we bring things back from space, they're full of holes. Um, because of these tiny dust grains that cause a lot of damage because they're so energetic. We absolutely have to worry about the micrometeoroid environment. Um, we will have holes through that sun shield. However, getting through one layer of our sun shield will slow those micrometeoroids down enough that they won't make it through the second layer of the sun shield. And as long as we don't have holes that go through multiple layers, we're able to stay nice and cold. We'll also have micrometeoroids putting little pock marks on our mirrors. The mirrors are all out there and exposed. Um, so what we do is we account for how much area we're going to lose because whenever the micrometeoroid hits, we lose a little bit of the coating so we don't get as much reflection off of that area. Um, so we account for that to make sure that at the end of the life, we're still getting the same amount of return that we need to meet our scientific requirements. Uh, the other really interesting thing about the micrometeoroids pummeling these mirrors is they will actually change the curvature of each of these mirror segments over time. After years of being bombarded, it's enough to actually slightly warp that mirror, but luckily we have those radius of curvature actuators um, that let us change the shape of the curvature of the mirror so we can help com compensate for that. Great question. Yeah? Is there a plan B? <laughs> Is there a plan B? It yeah, so there are certainly deployments that absolutely have to happen for this telescope to work. If that sun shield does not deploy, mission over. If, because our detectors, being an infrared telescope, our detectors don't work above 77 Kelvin. So we have to get cold for the cameras to work. If the secondary mirror does not deploy, end of mission, because we can't return light back into the science cameras. If the wings on the sides of the mirror where we fold out the last three, if those fail to deploy, not end of mission, we just have a little less collecting area. Um, and it gets more and more graceful from there on if, if there are issues. Um, so there are challenges and we have no planned way to be able to go service it. Now I would imagine that we'd probably get excited about getting to do some cool robotic mission that far away to try to do something, but it would be really hard. This telescope wasn't designed to be serviced. Uh, we don't have cameras. We didn't, we didn't put a GoPro, right, like Elon Musk did on his, on his Roadster. We don't have cameras to say what didn't deploy. We have to infer it from the um, telemetry that we get back that says, you know, what is the strain here? and did this close there and that kind of thing. Um, so no, no plan B. This was really expensive. We only built one of them, unfortunately. Um, so hopefully it works. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We'll go back there first. Yeah. How did you deal with the question of um, reliability and redundancy? Yeah. So the que so is how did we deal with reliability and redundancy? Back, which is kind of the same question of what if it doesn't work. So we have to be fully redundant. That means all of our electronics, for example, we have two strings of electronics. If side A stops working, we switch to side B. There are some things that are not fully redundant. Um, you know, our motors have redundant windings, but there's still only one physical action to move them, right? One drive screw. Uh, so the, redundant, the um, reliability is, the requirements, I don't know, 3.9 something, um, 3.97, something like that. So we have a requirement on how reliable we need to be, and we build a system that meets that. Yes? What are all the advantages of being at L2? Advantages of being L2. So the main advantage for us is the ability to keep the hot stuff on one side of us. Um, the other advantage is just in general for observing, if, if you're like Hubble and you're orbiting the Earth just a few hundred miles up, you're going through day and night all the time just like us, so you can only observe at night. We can observe all the time. Um, and over the course of a year, we can observe nearly the entire sky. Yep. How long is it supposed to last? It is um, designed to last at least five years with a goal of 10. Yeah. Well, I've worked in the air 
aerospace industry and trying to get aerospace engineers uh, to manage them is like herding cats. <laughs> and I, I was just wondering, I mean, you've been the, the program manager and you have so many details of this project. Have you thought of like writing a book or, <laughs> I mean, you've got to have some good stories. Um, so I, I, I will caveat that Managing scientists is more like herding cats. Engineers are a little bit more focused. Um, and I have both on my team, so I can speak from experience. Um, and I know that I, I'm not personally planning to write a book. NASA ha actually has a program historian who has followed the, both the telescope development and more specifically the science team um, since the late 90s, so there's certainly that historical information out there, and at some point, the folks at NASA will write books. <laughs> yeah? I don't know how much more time you have, but in 16 years, how, how much has your technology of like the sensors and the detectors, I mean, is it just unbelievably, like, exponentially better? Like, could you imagine when you started how uh, I mean, are you able to also use current electronics, or are you still using proven electronics from years ago? That's the that's the right point, right? You know, so when I started early in my career, I worked on Hubble instruments, and Hubble was built in the 70s, and so we always like to joke, oh yeah, NASA, you know, we're on the trailing edge of technology. <laughs> but that's because we, you know, we had to interface with these systems. Of course, the cameras have gotten much, much better over time, but ultimately you design something on a certain day, and that's what you build. So no, we're not able to take advantage of all of, you know, advancements since then. That being said, the real challenge here is that we have to use you know, electronics, um, Tripoli parts and computers and that kind of thing is a great example. We think, you know, on the ground, how much has our, have our phones advanced in the last 16 years? We have to build electronics that can survive a space radiation environment. Um, and the electronics that control all these mirrors also reside on the telescope. So that means they have to operate at 30 Kelvin. Try to bring your phone down to 20 Fahrenheit and it might not work. Um, so we don't use cutting edge, top of the line digital electronics um, for a system like this. We use analog electronics um, to control all of, the, all of the meters on the telescope because we can find those that survive this kind of temperature environment. Um, also for web, usually when NASA builds something, right, it's really expensive and it takes a lot of years and it's really hard and we want to know that it's going to succeed because we don't have the budget to build a couple of things so that if one doesn't work we can use the other. We don't have the advantage like we do with our phones and our computers to just upgrade it and send version 2.0 out. Um, it's got to be right the first time and so Usually when NASA launches something, they want as few really big advances as possible so that they have high confidence that it can work. For the Webb telescope, they had 10 brand new technologies that were developed just for Webb, um, which is pretty much unheard of to have that many new technologies that you have to prove out on, the, on a single program. And so some of the things that we prove for that because, because it's taken us a really long time, some of the things like detectors, we had to develop all of these detectors from scratch. The technology develop we put, development we put into it has let other observatories, ground and space base, use our detectors before us, but they're still the best ones out there. Um, so, you know, it's a mixed bag, but it is true that whatever we launch was designed when it was designed, and that's what it's built for. But nothing like this has ever been done. So this is all still completely state of the art. Um, and on the ground system, we're able to take some advantage of um, extra processing speed and that kind of thing to improve performance on the ground. Yeah? What will happen to Hubble once this telescope goes up? 
what will happen to Hubble? So the goal, cross our fingers, is that we have overlap between Hubble and Webb. We'd like to be able to observe the same thing with both telescopes at the same time. Um, Hubble, Hubble's life is independent of Webb. We will, Hubble will last as long as we can eke out um, performance and as long as its gyros keep working and that sort of thing. Um, so they're independent. Any other questions? Yeah. Absolutely. So, all right, I can't see you guys. I'm going to move over here so I can see you better. All right. Um, first of all, awesome to be interested in space. My biggest advice is to keep doing what is fun and interesting, right? If it is cool to explore space and look through your telescope, do that. If it is awesome to dig in the dirt and figure out what lay how far, how deep the worms are living, do that, but stay curious because ultimately everything we're doing here, nobody's ever done it before. We don't know how to do it. We didn't go to school to learn how to do this. We have to figure it out. So when we went to school, we wanted to learn how to solve problems. That's what you want to learn. Keep solving problems. Yep. Yes. It can. <laughs> Tell me about that. It can change blue or green or orange, which it is the color. Oh, yeah. So if we look at it in different wavelengths, just like we were talking about here, we can see different colors out of it. And they tell us how hot it is. And different parts of the sun have different temperatures, which is pretty cool, huh? Did you see the eclipse? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a volunteer here, and I've been bringing my kids here for the last, since they were like four and six years old. Mm -hmm. And we had kind of grown up with being in here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and my son became an official volunteer last year at 10 years old. So he runs the telescope, and mm -hmm. he's kind of learning how we all do our presentations and stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you really like you know, if they like it here, mm -hmm. and it's something that you find interesting, spend more time here, maybe pop in once a month and just shadow and understand yeah. it. Maybe your kids will grow up and be volunteers. What you guys need to do is you need to beg your mom and dad to drag you over every month. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the yeah, other... The other really cool thing about space, I mean, first it's exposure, right? Exposure is so important and having this resource here with the, you know, with the observatory is awesome. The other great thing about space is that we need every different type of person with every different type of degree and background you can imagine to build these things. We have people with every type of science and engineering degree you can imagine. We need business people. We need communications folks. We need lawyers. We need the technicians who actually build it because all of us engineers do not build these things. We have amazing technicians that are much more skilled at that than we are. So if you're interested in space, there is always a way to get there, no matter what your academic interests or strengths are. Yes. How much longer will Hubble live? Um, let's see, I have not heard current estimates in the last few years. Um, I think they're hoping t between 2020 and 2025. I don't know if you've heard okay. some more than that. Is the goal. I think they're expecting it to, at a minimum, last to 2020. And really, you know, I think they're fairly confident 2025. All right, anything else? Awesome. Thank you guys. It was really great talking to you guys.